Good afternoon, and welcome to our virtual event, Why It's Okay to Speak Your Mind. I'm Raihan Salam, president of the Manhattan Institute, and I'm very excited to talk today with Rishikesh Joshi, professor of philosophy at Bowling Green State University and the author of the excellent new book, Why It's Okay to Speak Your Mind. We're in the midst of intense debates about free speech on college campuses, ideological diversity in media, and censorship online. Professor Joshi is an important emerging voice in these conversations, bringing much needed analytical rigor and clear thinking to bear. His book and our conversation today step back from the controversies of the day to consider some more basic questions. How does our society make sense of itself? Do we have processes in place to make sure our ideas get stress tested before they're deployed? Throughout the conversation, please feel free to submit your questions on whatever platform you're watching us on. We'll save some time at the end to get as many of them as we can. Rishi, thank you very much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Excited to talk to you about the book and, and these issues. So. Rishi, mm -hmm. one thing you get out of the way early on in the book is that you are not making a case for free speech as such. You leave that to John Stuart Mill, you leave that to others. But it does <clears> seem <throat> as though when you're looking at the uh, climate, when you're looking at the world of political philosophy, this is contested in a way it hasn't been in the past. So can you tell us a bit about the debate around free speech itself before we move on? Yeah, so I mean, the, the debate on free speech is this uh, debate on um, whether we should have uh, kind of uh, legal protections for free speech. Um, so, you know, we have the First Amendment, which guarantees a legal protection uh, for free speech. Um, what is what is much more interesting, though, is um, the the, the, the kind of uh, pressures that people feel to not disclose their opinions. And that's really uh, what, what I focus on in the book. Um, and um, so, yeah, exactly. So, I mean, um, so, so it's, it's increasingly relevant because uh, recent polls show that uh, most people are, are afraid to uh, share their opinions, especially when it comes to contested issues. Um, and what, one of the kind of um, disturbing patterns is that this goes up more as people are more educated. So the more higher, higher educated people feel more uh, hesitance about uh, uh, talking about their ideas. Um, um, and you know, one poll actually shows that this is uh, three times uh, at its height compared to the, the Red Scare. So the Red Scare with um, McCarthy and so on in the, in the 50s. Um, so the number of people that said they're hesitant to speak their minds or, or say what they think, um, that number is more than tripled now. Um, and so one kind of question that's, that's um, uh, kind of underexplored is, what does this mean for, for humanity going forward? What does this mean for policymaking? Um, and so that, that's really, I think, what the um, interesting question to me is. And what should individuals do? So we find ourselves in this kind of situation where, I mean, there, there are serious costs to uh, expressing, expressing your opinions and that's becoming easily. So people don't really, feel scared for no reason, right? So it's not like a kind of uh, irrational fear. Um, people, I mean, I don't like to use the word cancel, but you know, that's that's the kind of uh, way people have been talking about it. So so there's this fear, you know, um, what will my colleagues think? What will my uh, boss think? And and they're, they're real fears. And so what should uh, what should people do as, as individuals? Um, and that's that's kind of my my focus in the book. In your book, you mainly, though not exclusively, address your arguments to people in knowledge-producing industries like academia, think tanks, journalism. Can you tell us a bit about why we should pay special attention to the norms and climate of these professions in particular? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, it's these industries that kind of give us a picture of the world, right? So we rely on them, you know, when we want to know about something like, um, you know, what is the relation, you know, any kind of policy adjacent issue, for example, when we say, okay, what is the relation between guns and crime? Or what is the, you know, what is the right immigration policy or, or climate change? Um, we rely on these knowledge producing industries. And that's, you know, one of the themes I, I explore is this uh, division of labor. Um, so, uh, you know, as society has progressed, we have uh, intense division of labor. Um, you know, Adam Smith, the philosopher talks about the division of labor and how it increases productivity. Um, but our division of labor is not just with respect to uh, making things or, or professions. It's also with respect to knowledge production, right? So we all kind of specialize in a, 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 a small field. And so we have to rely on others. So one of, the, one of the things I explore in the book is this idea that our knowledge is a kind of common resource. Um, 
And since we rely on these knowledge producing industries, we have to rely on journalists, we have to rely on academics to know what the world is like. Um, we should be especially uh, wary of social pressures to conceal information or um, uh, conceal evidence or avoiding giving certain types of arguments in those professions because, um, you know, I argue that only, only under kind of a free, robust exchange of ideas uh, are we able to justifiably believe in something. So, so here I pick up on, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill's idea. So John Stuart Mill uh, wrote that even if Newtonian philosophy, which is basically Newtonian physics, um, at the time was a very kind of robust uh, physical theory, he said even if that could not be challenged, so if people had, it, had an incentive not to challenge it, we couldn't really... Uh, believe in it. So the idea is that um, whether or not we're justified in believing something, for example, Newtonian physics, uh, depends on the social incentives. So the social incentives must be that we can challenge anything, we can debate anything, and only in that kind of uh, atmosphere can we uh, rely, reliably believe in something like Newtonian physics, um, which was at the time like a kind of uh, bedrock uh, view in physics. Of course, later on, um, you know, Einstein kind of modified that and said that Newtonian physics is only true in approximation. But the idea is that, um, you know, when we believe something about, about policy or about, uh, you know, just what the world is like, we can only be justified in believing that if uh, the incentives are right. And, and, you know, there's reason to worry about whether the incentives are right within um, uh, academia or within uh, journalism on hotly contested issues. I think the, I mean, my, my view is that incentives are right when it comes to kind of cold issues, right? So, um, you know, nobody's going to get mad at you if you uh, uh, discover like a new polymer or, or a new fact about the cell wall or, you know, the, or so physics, biology, chemistry are fairly robust and we can see how successful they are, right? I mean, we're teleconferencing through this, uh, you know, what, what would have looked like magic a hundred years ago. Um, so, so engineering, physics, these are very kind of robust fields because there's no cost to coming up with a new idea or disputing an idea. So, so if you say, well, this, this uh, semiconductor doesn't really work well, you're not going to get like blowback. But when it comes to things like, you know, what is, you know, minimum wage, uh, immigration, policing, all these issues, there's, I mean, you have to worry about whether uh, there are incentives to not give certain arguments or not give, uh, certain types of evidence, um, and so and so we should be especially uh, kind of attentive to those those ideas um, or those uh, those fields of knowledge production. So that includes you know think tanks, universities, uh, and so on. Yeah, that's interesting, Rishi. Uh, you know, when you're describing some scientific domains, you know, in the book you discuss that there's some that have incentives and procedures in place to test their ideas. You are celebrated for falsifying an unsound thesis. Uh, whereas when you're looking at the social sciences, what I'm hearing you say is that there's something very different at work. Uh, so is this a question of the breakdown of professional norms? Uh, you know, Should we be much more skeptical when we're reading papers published in sociology journals than we're reading papers published in chemistry journals? Um, I. I'm inclined to think that because sociology or, or, or other fields that are kind of adjacent to policy are, are not as, um, you know, I mean, Glenn Lowry talks about this, for example, and he has a great paper from 1994 where, um, you know, he says, you know, uh, if, if you kind of propose a certain thesis in, in sociology or economics, one reaction is just what kind of sociologist or what kind of ec economist would argue something like that. So, there is a kind of tendency of people um, to kind of uh, assail the character of somebody who maybe uh, proposes proposes a thesis that maybe the majority in the field uh, don't like, which which isn't there in um, in something like physics. And so, if you're working in sociology or, or you know uh, various various fields, you're going to think twice before you know you're going to say, well, I don't I don't want people to attack my character, so I'm just going to not. Um, look into this issue, right? Or I'm going to say what my peers uh, would like would like to hear in, on this issue. And so, when it, so I mean, Lowry, for example, talks about like when a community wants to reach a particular conclusion and kind of structures its incentives to get to that conclusion, then we 
you know, that, then we can't really be uh, uh, confident in the in the output of it. So I kind of uh, take take that argument from La from Larry, but that's a uh, uh, yeah. So I mean, there yeah. So there is that disanalogy there between these uh, different uh, social you know social science and uh, and physics, um, and especially you know these policy adjacent issues because that's where kind of partisan thinking comes in, right? So uh, there's a lot you know there's lots of research recently on um, how partisan thinking kind of distorts our um, our the way the way we process information. So um, yeah, so I mean, one one possible solution to that is more kind of uh, diversity of various kinds, uh, you know, ideological and so on within these uh, science social sciences, so that people can uh, go back and forth and test their ideas. Uh, Throughout the book, you argue that people should share their evidence regardless of the social cost. Uh, this is an important idea. It's a challenging one. But I want to bring us to uh, a, a condition that many of us find ourselves in. Uh, it, it's this idea of standpoint epistemology, uh, this idea that we should privilege firsthand experience of a phenomenon or proximity to a phenomenon over other forms of knowledge. So, for example, you know, when you're having a policy debate in a class uh, about immigration policy, if there's someone who says, I myself am an immigrant or I'm the child of an immigrant, that person might receive a lot of deference in the conversation. Uh, this idea of speaking as X, speaking as a working class Scottish socialist, speaking as a political philosopher or li living in a small town in northern Ohio, it has become a very powerful rhetorical device uh, in a lot of places. What do you think about standpoint epistemology and how it shapes our ability to reach sound conclusions uh, and have rigorous conversations about evidence? Well, I'm an immigrant, so you should listen to me about <laughs> about immigration. <laughs> and you're, you're, you know, you're the child of an uh, immigrant. But um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, you know, uh, I mean, to be to be to be fair, I mean, I think you know, firsthand experience is important. You know, um, you know, you can't capture everything in um, regression analysis or, or data. Um, but you know, it, it it can't be the only kind of. Uh, uh, way we, we look at things and especially from a kind of social scientific perspective, you know, what kinds of policies lead to what kind of outcomes. Um, I mean, so again, so saying, you know, standpoint epistemology has the kind of uh, virtue that it, it, um, it may, you know, it, it kind of takes into account people's experiences, which are ob obviously, you know, very important. If we, if we just look at the world as like a uh, Excel spreadsheet, we're kind of, you know, losing losing something there. But um, but but I think you know it has to be also supplemented with like rigorous data analysis and um, and and looking at what kind of policies have what kind of outcomes. Um, yeah. So so I think I yeah. Just maybe the boring answer there is like we need both. You know, so we need firsthand experiences. We need to look at those and and what we also need. Um, regressions. <laughs> when you talk about the kind of social cost, to what extent is your argument directed at leaders of institutions who are thinking about the norms they're setting out to establish? And to what extent is it aimed at individuals who might be anxious about social opprobrium, who might be anxious about the thought that were they to speak their mind, this is going to have a material effect on their livelihood, on their relationships? Um, yeah, so that's that's a great question, and I think um, you know I, I think I'm addressing really everybody. So, uh, but I think your you know your responsibility maybe goes up the more power you have or the more um, kind of secure your job is. So within academia, you know, uh, if we look at the kind of structure, you know, graduate students are the most vulnerable, and so um, it, it, and and then maybe tenure track professors such as myself who are not tenured yet. And then the tenured professors, and they have uh, much much more status, and they you know they have very robust protections in terms of uh, what they can say. Um, of course, there there are costs there too. So if you're a tenured professor and you say something your your peers uh, frown upon, you can you can lose lose some status, but at least you can't lose lose your job as easily. So um, yeah, so it, it you know one thing I emphasize in the book is that the costs differ, and that's um, the costs. So I mean, if you're uh, living in an authoritarian regime, it's too much for mor morality to ask of us to uh, speak your mind and get sent to the gulag or whatnot. But um, 
but so yeah so you, but but on the other hand we should be able to we, we should be willing to take some costs in order to improve uh you know our our kind of collective uh picture of the world um uh just just as we should be willing to take some costs in helping others or in um you know protecting the environment um you know protecting the environment involves some costs maybe maybe it's more costly to to uh, buy a more efficient vehicle but you know lots of people are fine with saying that you know we should be willing to take some cost to protect some protect a common resource that's helpful to all of us and and so likewise so I kind of plug that reasoning into speaking your mind and I call it the epistemic commons which is our shared picture of the world or our shared um, knowledge and we should be willing to take to take some costs uh, uh, you know m- maybe not up to like losing your job or something like that but but a, but a small loss to status or or you know um, that that should be something where we should be willing to do in some contexts and of course again as you say those those differ across you know if you're the the you know if the if you're the leader of an institute you also have much more power and maybe you have more stability uh, than if you're like a graduate student or a or a starting journalist or something like that. Yeah. You observed earlier on that when you look at public opinion surveys, there is this really pervasive anxiety about speaking your mind. Now, given what you've just said, uh, is part of what you're hoping to do to get people to be a little bit more courageous, uh, to kind of get their backs up? Because you're thinking that if you see some small change, some small increase in the willingness to speak your mind, that this would affect a larger healthy cultural change? Absolutely, yeah. So I mean, I think I think uh, courage, courage of this kind may be a bit contagious, right? So people, uh, people mostly. I mean, there's lots of psychological um, studies that show that people mostly don't want to be alone, right? So if you're, uh, you know, if, uh, the listeners want to want to uh, look up the um, Ash experiments, they're a great kind of demonstration of this. Um, people mostly don't want to be don't want to be alone, and if they have even one person that shares their view, they're much more likely to um, say say what they think. Um, you know, it, the ash experiment actually shows that people are about four times more likely to to say what they really think uh, if they have even one if they have even one other um, person who is who is sharing their opinion. So, so there's that fear of isolation, and so uh, you know, so even if one person speaks, they can have this kind of a snowball effect on others, um, and so that's that's the hope with this with this book. Um. I wonder um, when you're looking at political and policy debates. One thing that is striking is that uh, the debates often take the form of not engaging with someone's idea, but really engaging with what you believe to be the social forces responsible for the fact that someone dares advance an idea. So for example, in the conversation about climate change, uh, there are people who express skepticism about consensus views on those issues. And then the reaction often seems to be more, well, you must be funded by this or that nefarious actor rather than let me engage with a substance of what you've argued. And you, you see this in that direction. You also see it in the other direction. You'll see people on the right, uh, accuse people on the left of advancing certain views simply because they're fashionable or high status. I wonder what you think about that, uh, you know, whether or not that species of argument where you're thinking about the kind of interests and structures and incentives at work behind the actual argument, do you see that as, as perfectly fine? Or do you think that we ought to focus more on the content of the arguments being made? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we ought to uh, fo- focus on the content um, and, you know, Focusing on the motives kind of creates this a uh, bad incentive structure again. So I mean, um, you know, just going back to to Lowry's point, you know, within especially when you have like uh, a kind of lopsided field, right? So if you have a, a kind of lopsided um, a, a field of inquiry or something like that, and, and you know, one person says something that is uh, that is different, and then people suddenly uh, kind of question their motives, that kind of really hinders the pursuit of of truth seeking. Uh, and so, I mean, Mill, there's a famous quote from Mill where he says, um, only through the studied moderation of language can we really uh, promote these norms of people, um, you know, sharing what they, what they really think um, and, and avoiding these kind of, um, kind of cultural, cultural blind spots that we might have. Um, and, and I mean, one, one thing I want to say is that, you know, when people suppress information, 
that can lead to very bad outcomes, right? So, um, so one of the things I talk about in the book is if you look at the Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plant, the, you know, the big reason why it had the effect that it did, why people weren't able to stop the um, the, the meltdown and get people evacuated, um, and as a result, you know, people to this day suffer from uh, the the effects of the of the nuclear meltdown. Um, a lot of it happened because people were incentivized to uh, suppress information at crucial junctures. So there's these kind of evidential bottlenecks that you see um, in something like Chernobyl, and that leads to a, to this disaster because you know people do, just don't know what's going on, right? So in order to act properly, we need to kind of know what's know what the world is like. So. Um, so there's Chernobyl. Uh, another good example comes from World War II. So one of the one of the um, kind of postmortems of World War II is one of the ways the Allied had an advantage over the uh, German or the Axis powers, where within the Axis powers there was much less free flow of information. And so, so for example, the German upper command had a had a less kind of um, accurate picture of what the war, uh, how the war war was going. Uh, so that's that's obviously a, a good thing in retrospect. Um, but you know, okay. So these are uh, authoritarian cases, but I, I I argue that you know democracy doesn't like is not a panacea. Um, so so this happened, for example, with with respect to the Bay of Pigs. So there was the the Bay of Pigs fiasco, and um, and that kind of actually spawned the literature on on groupthink. And one of the kind of postmodern analyses of that was that. Um, People who had doubts about the Bay of Pigs didn't really uh, didn't really share those doubts, and so as a result, um, we weren't able to to tell uh, whether it would be successful or not. And so, um, and so the only way we can kind of remove these evidential bottlenecks if, is if we don't go straight to the character of the person. You know, um, well, what kind of person would raise doubts on this uh, nuclear power plant? Are you trying to, you know? Um, or, or the Bay of Pigs? Are you trying to uh, are you pro communist or something? Right, like it's um, um, so yeah. So th those are just some examples which I think um, help uh, help help to think about this issue. Um, so when you're talking about the importance of the epistemic commons, you're talking about something that is very high stakes. Uh, when you're thinking about our long run growth trajectory, when you're thinking about resolving deep seated. Uh, social problems, uh, you know, it seems that having this willingness to speak your mind is incredibly important. It's incredibly mm -hmm. high stakes. Yet you're also someone who, you know, I think it's fair to say is a philosopher working in the classical liberal tradition. And part of the thinking there is that we don't necessarily want to pursue top-down interventions. Uh, we don't necessarily want state mandates. Uh, you know, what we want, you know, kind of is for, you know, kind of a more voluntary approach. Absolutely, Yet it's also the yeah. case it's also the case that when you're looking at, you know, many powerful academic institutions, uh, these are institutions where there is a really dramatic and quite extreme um, ideological homogeneity. And it's something that has bearing on the kind of uh, issues that you're describing. There are a number of people who have advanced the argument that if you care about ideological diversity, you need to now given the condition we find ourselves in, given the extent of the homogeneity, you need to embrace some form of intervention in order to promote greater political diversity. Now, this is obviously very uncomfortable for those of us who, you know, again, are rooted in the classical liberal tradition, but I wonder what you make of that, given the stakes uh, of preserving this epistemic commons, ensuring that it's healthy. Do you feel as though the uh, you know, kind of a situation has become grave enough that it might necessitate some kind of government intervention to protect ideological diversity. Yeah, I mean, I I haven't I, I haven't thought about the specifics of of that issue as as much. You know how you know how the government intervention would would figure out, and um, you know, I mean, I mean, one worry with with government intervention is there's always unintended consequences. Um, um, you know, you you can always you have to very Carefully think about what the incentives are of, of individual people for for a um, uh, for a government intervention like that to work well. Um, but I mean, at at this point, I'm just uh, trying to kind of you know encourage uh, individuals to see some benefits of of uh, diversity in this way. Um, so I mean, regardless of where you are on the spectrum, I think 
one thing that is important that everybody should be willing to able to agree with is in order to make progress uh, or in order to make the world a better place, we need to know what the world is like. We need to know what works, what doesn't. So, I mean, the best intentions can lead to bad outcomes, right? So, I mean, um, there's this great example, you know, the, the Cobra effect, uh, which comes from, uh, you know, the, the colonial government in, uh, in India, uh, there was a problem of cobras in, in uh, Delhi. So the cobra is a Indian cobra is a, uh, po a poisonous snake and, and it was a kind of pest in New Delhi. And so the, um, the, the colonial government at the time wanted to get, get, get rid of it. And so they said, um, okay, uh, uh, whoever brings a dead cobra will, will give them a, a, an amount of money as, as a way to get rid of the cobra population. Um, but what happened is as a result of that, actually, the cobra population increased because people started to grow cobras in order to sell them to the government um, and, and, and make money, right? So, okay, so that kind of illustrates that you can have a good intention. I mean, the, um, the, okay, the colonial government had mixed intentions, some good, some bad, maybe. But, but this, this particular intention was good, which is getting rid of the cobras. But good intentions coupled with... Uh, a, a, a kind of counterproductive policy can lead to a to bad outcome. And so even if we have good intentions, we want to make progress um, uh, or, we, or we want to alleviate various social problems that we all agree are social problems. It, it need not be a, a partisan thing at all. But we have to have an accurate picture of what the world is like. And so it doesn't matter if you're left, right, center, or top, bottom. Everyone should be able to agree that we need a accurate picture of the world. And, and given what we know just about, you know, group polarization, things like that. Um, so yeah, group polarization is this thing from, uh, you know, the scholar, uh, legal scholar Cass Sunstein, who talks about if you take a group of people who are just a little bit, let's say, let's say they're just a bit pro minimum wage, you put them together, ask them to deliberate, they come out super pro minimum wage, right? And it seems like that there's something off going on there. It's not like, it seems like they're not tracking the truth. They're just kind of reinforcing each other's tendencies to go more to the extreme. And so what, what comes out as that deliberation, you know, at, at least when we, when we think about it um, kind of carefully, need not be the truth, right? So, um, so dynamics like group, group polarization and other things we know just about how people, how people deliberate when they're in a homogenous group um, and by the way, I should I should mention that that occurred that that is not a partisan thing. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're a bit a little bit against minimum wage and you put them together in a in a, in a group uh, who who are all kind of a little bit against minimum wage, they come out thinking maybe minimum wage is bad; it should be zero or, or whatnot. So anytime you put a group of like-minded individuals together, even if they're not extremists, they come out being like extremists at at, at the end, and so. Group polarization is absolutely something we should, um, I think, worry about when it comes to uh, journalism, the academy, and so. So I mean, yeah, I think I think we should all basically want an accurate picture of the world because then uh, you can have the best intentions, but lead to lead to disaster if we don't have an accurate picture of the world. Um, so. There's also a question of whether you want heterogeneity, whether you want intellectual diversity within institutions, or whether it's sufficient to have it across institutions. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Because, you know, one could argue that, you know, to your point about group polarization, there's a cost to have this kind of alignment. Yet it's also true that in a larger intellectual landscape, uh, you know, if you have, um, you know, several institutions that have one kind of shared sensibility, having some other institutions that don't share that sensibility, you know, could potentially have some value. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that, you know, that could work because, you know, scholars then would be, you know, if, if you're a, a scholar working at, you know, a particular institution, let's say Yale, you're not just talking to people in Yale, right? You're, you're, uh, rip, you know, you're citing people from, uh, elsewhere, University of Michigan, UCLA, or whatnot. So you're you're kind of engaging with scholars a, a, across the board. And so, I mean, one way that diversity could be uh, achieved is, you know, if 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 you had, you know, well, um, you know, Yale sociology department leans this way, Harvard's one leans that way, uh, UCLA is like up there and out there somewhere. You know, that that could be a a, a healthy situation where where um, uh, you know there there's there's not 
you know, diversity within, uh, you know, uh, uh, institutions, but, th but there is a cross. And actually, I mean, that you, you find that within my own, my own field of philosophy in, in fields that I think are working well. Um, so, so things like, you know, the more theoretical parts of ethics, um, you know, you have Harvard, who's very known to be Kantian, of, you know, kind of in the tradition of Immanuel Kant, and you have uh, other places, so Princeton, which is known to be more consequentialist, and they kind of engage with each other. Uh, but you know, one worry I have is that that's 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 not true when it comes to politically polarized topics. Um, and there, you see, you know, Harvard, U Yale, UCLA, Berkeley, University of Florida, they all lean in one way, um, and so that's that's really the the problem. Um, I wonder, in my view. Earlier in your career, you were pursuing a PhD in engineering before you decided to embrace philosophy uh, as your discipline. And, you know, you do uh, offer relative optimism about the state of the hard sciences. Yet, as you know, uh, you know, there is a perception, particularly on scientific questions that are increasingly politicized, uh, or also just let's even you know say it, it goes beyond politicization. And here I'm going to be guilty of something I was talking about earlier on. When you think about the amount of public funding that goes into some domains, you know, it does seem as though it might shape the incentives and it actually might shape scientific discourse as well. Uh, when you're talking about standpoint epistemology, when you're talking about the imperative of racial and ethnic diversity, uh, there is a sense that it's not just the humanities, it's not just the social sciences, but the that there's actually a pervasive problem in the realm of knowledge production that you see reproduced in the sciences as well. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, do you see something similar to that too, or am I being overly pessimistic? Yeah, I mean, I I, I think lots of things in the in the. I mean, maybe climate climate science is is, is a bit more politicized, um, and that's you know maybe that's getting closer to to harder science. Um, but you know, when it comes to you know, like, uh, you know, I mean, in engineering, for example, there's like a field called photonics about, you know, lasers and so on. It, it, it's just not not uh, politicized at all, right? It's like nobody, I mean, in one sense, we care, we want more efficient lasers, but nobody nobody cares, right? So <laughs> It's like, not as know, though it, people on the left want yeah. less efficient lasers and people on the right want more efficient right, lasers. Right, right. Or n nobody has a kind of horse in the race. Um you know, like fluid dynamics or something like that. It's 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 not a not a hot button issue. People don't get uh, angry about it. Um, and and similar, I mean, even even with philosophy. So there's like these very abstract debates uh, about you know uh, whether there's a chair here or whether it's um, molecules arranged chair wise. So is the chair really an object over and above the molecules that compose it? That that's a super abstract debate, and uh, you know it's it's just not something people get like mad about or, or politicized. But, so, but, but so I mean, I think the less we can, the less we can politicize things and the less we can have a kind of um, a, a objective attitude towards these things, the more, you know, we can have healthy fields of discourse. But we should just, to, just to interrupt you here. So part of the issue though, is that, you know, if you're talking about the imperative of diversity within the field, you know, it could be that yes, you're having an abstract conversation, but you're also talking about, well, the people engaged in this particular abstract conversation, you know, ha this group has this demographic composition. Whereas the people who are thinking about some other question in social philosophy, perhaps this group is younger, perhaps this group is, you know, more likely to hail from the developing world or from underrepresented minorities. And so within departments, there does seem to be this kind of institutional politics at work that does seem to impinge on which scholarly questions get asked, which scholarly inquiry, which lines of scholarly inquiry are funded. Is that not true? Is that something that, uh, you know, is happening in your view or, or perhaps not? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't, um, I don't, I don't see it happening as much. Yeah. And these um, kind of more abstract debates and more, more kind of things where, where it's, um, you know, kind of, kind of cold to us. Um, but uh, yeah, but yeah, I mean, that, uh, 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 just in terms of what I've seen, yeah, it's uh, it's not so much an issue with with these kind of more hard sciences or more more abstract uh, fields. 
when you talk about the importance of the epistemic commons, you know, earlier on, you were talking about wartime. You were talking mm -hmm. again about these conditions where things are very high stakes. Mm -hmm. Could it be that we have been departing from those norms that you champion of tolerating intellectual diversity, uh, of you know, kind of uh, encouraging people to share their evidence? Could it be that uh, this is a reflection of our relative affluence? Uh, the fact that this is a relatively peaceful moment uh, in our history, the stakes are not quite as high, therefore status seeking, uh, therefore this desire to avoid doing things that might be difficult, that might get you in trouble with your friends. Uh, could that be part of what's happening to our intellectual culture? Just people don't feel the sense of urgency uh, to share their evidence? I, th I think that's that's that uh, that's that sounds exactly right. It's, it's a very kind of a prosperous, I mean, all things considered, it's a very prosperous time, um, highest kind of standard of living that we've ever uh, uh, achieved. You know, like the average person now, you know, or or I'll just speak for myself. You know, I, I live better than the King of France in, you know, 300 years ago. King of France 300 years ago gets a small bacterial infection, could die. I get a small bacterial infection. I go to the hospital. They can cure me very quickly. So we have this kind of um, unseen prosperity when we compare to when we compare like life expectancy, you know, 500 years ago, it's probably like 20 or 30, even in the, even in the, um, the richest countries. And now, you know, in the richest countries, it's more like 80. So we have this uh, kind of um, era of, of unseen prosperity. And so maybe, maybe I think, I think that's exactly right, that people don't feel the sense of urgency. So you might think like, well, things are going good anyway going well anyway and so, so i don't have to stick well, my neck out i don't know wh why do why should i uh, express this uh th that decreases my status for no for no gain right um but but i want to push back on that a little bit uh you know and, and i think i think this is a this is a kind of temptation that many people will have um i want to push back on that be because you know though we're also in the in the kind of highest prosperity we're also changing very, very, very fast, right? So, um, so think of like what the uh, what the li what life was like for the average person in twelve thousand BC, and compare it with twelve thousand one hundred BC. Basically, no difference. You have hunter gatherers and so on, um, living basically the same life. Now compare uh, six hundred AD and five hundred AD. Uh, okay, so you know you have some kings getting killed, and you have some, you know, different, you know, new new king here or there, new queen. Uh, but but really for the for the average shepherd or peasant, it's really the same thing. You have some wars here and there. Now compare like 2021 with like 1921. It's just like, I mean, it's completely different. Uh, you know, you can read a, a kind of old uh, Fitzgerald or Hemingway novel and, uh, and just see like how different life is, how different attitudes are. And so, I mean, the, so our, our rate of change is very, very fast. And increasingly, we live in a kind of interconnected world, right? So so if we have a blind spot on policy, that's going to affect uh, the future in much more uh, kind of powerful way than it would have affected, uh, you know, back then. So, you know, if, if we look at history, we, we can uh, uh, observe that or, or we can acknowledge that, uh, you know, every culture that we've seen has certain blind, spot, blind spots. Um, uh, and, you know, w one thing from Mill you get and, and that I try to emphasize, it's like, well, it's, it seems like weird to say, okay, like you look back throughout history and you say, well, they had these blind spots, you know, throughout history, each culture had a blind spot. But right now we don't have any blind spots, right? That would be kind of surprising. Um, and so, but but the blind spots in the uh, in history kind of only affected kind of local uh, circumstances. So for example, uh, in China for, for a, thousand, a thousand years, they had this this um, practice of foot foot binding for, for women. And we now we can look back and say, okay, maybe that, was, that wasn't that was the best practice, but that only affected people in China, right? So it didn't, you know, affect people, you know, the, the uh, you know, Native Americans or people living in India or people living in Africa or Europe. But now any kind of, you know, we're, we're kind of all in, this, in the same boat increasingly now, right? So any kind of blind spot we have kind of reverberates throughout the world and uh, the world is changing very rapidly. So I think those things mean that, you know, even though we're not in like World War II or something, it is still, it's deceptively, uh, you know, 
Uh, it's higher. It's, this, it's, it's higher stakes, stakes than stakes. people assume. Yes, it's higher stakes than people assume because it's changing so rapidly. I mean, what is the world going to look like in 2060? It's probably going to be very, very, very different. And so, so we have to be careful. You know? I wonder. Uh, you are a political philosopher who has worked on a number of issues that are intensely polarized. And where I think it's fair to say that the balance of opinion uh, in the academy, the balance of opinion within academic political philosophy is not where you are. Uh, one example of this is immigration. Uh, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but you know, my, my general sense is that the arguments that have proven um, you know, most widespread, most popular uh, in academic political philosophy are those that advocate a kind of open borders stance. Absolutely, whereas yeah. you've are you've offered, you know, modest prudential arguments for some limited immigration restrictions. I'm curious uh, if you could tell us a bit about your experience doing that, going against the grain uh, and kind of living according to, you know, your book about why it's important to speak your mind. Yeah. I mean, I think um, I, you know, I think there, there, there are certainly challenges. I think, yeah, with, with immigration, I think the, um, the uh, majority opinion by far is, is pro open borders um, so that, you know, that there should be no kind of immigration restrictions across the world. You know, in, in, in some uh, work, I, I kind of raised doubts about that. I mean, in that particular uh, case, I haven't, I, I haven't felt uh, too much kind of blowback. Um, uh, but part, yeah, maybe, maybe it's just because I'm a, I'm a more junior person. So people don't, <laughs> they don't find uh, you feel, threatening. feel like they have to uh, attack <laughs> me or something, but um uh, yeah, but but it's certainly an uphill battle. Um, uh, in in you know, if you have um, kind of views that 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 diverge from the from the mainstream on um, on some of these kind of polarized issues. Do you sense um, that there are some people who are grateful to you for taking a contrasting view just because it's a little less boring to have someone to actually maybe argue some with? people. And I personally find it like less boring. You know, I just uh, <laughs> you know part of my motive. You know. Part of my motivation is the epistemic commons, I guess, but uh, part of it is just like, it's kind of boring to agree with everybody. So, uh, so you know, um, it, it, it's kind of kind of more more exciting. So, I mean, Nietzsche has this great quote where he says, um, you know, the, the, w the way to extract most from life is, is to embrace the danger and uh, build your houses on the mount, mountain of uh, Vesuvius. So maybe I've built my house a bit, a bit further, but still kind of maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Maybe decently close to Vesuvius, so we'll, we'll see if it erupts uh, or not. You know. That could be the title of your <laughs> memoir, yeah, Close to Vesuvius. Yeah, yeah, uh, we, we have a number of questions from the audience, and also I do want to encourage everyone, if you have any questions, regardless of which platform you're using, please type them in. Uh, so here is a question from Adam Simmons. Is the uniquely American epidemic of perpetual adolescence a contributing factor to cancel culture? Yeah, um, yeah. So maybe this this kind of uh, uh, ties into you know uh, you know I'm I'm kind of uh, thinking out loud here. Uh, kind of ties into this idea of decadence, right? So we're we're kind of you know living in un, uh, unseen prosperity, and so maybe many people. I mean, look, everybody has their challenges and and um, trials and so on. But you know, when you compare to like the generation in like 1930 or 1840 or something. We're we're living a very uh, privileged life. Um, one of the things I I think is like the best, the highest privilege is the time privilege. So like we're, you know, uh, being born now is like, you know, a, a great privilege in terms of like being born in like 1720 or something. So maybe uh, something. maybe uh, maybe that's kind of a, a led us to be uh, to led us to. Kind of exaggerate small problems and, and small slights and so on uh, because we haven't uh, we haven't suffered enough or something like that. So suffering creates character. I think. I mean, that's what. Uh, yeah, one of the things uh, Nietzsche emphasized. Uh, yeah. There's a related question from Stevan Velgovic, uh, and it's whether or not these trends you describe, the uh, lack of willingness to speak your mind, whether this is a reflection of simple malaise and boredom. Do you think that there's just, a, you know, just kind of a lack of energy, a lack of vim and vigor? That's why people don't hunger for a confrontation? 
Yeah, that could partly be it. Um, I think you know. I think a lot of it too is just uh, just being just being afraid. Um, so I mean, Adam Smith, for example, uh, uh, thought that you know we seek the, uh, and he was very um, perceptive on this. So he thought that uh, we seek the approval of others, even even when there are no costs, right? So we we're kind of an approval seeking creature, and that's obviously very uh, important if you look at our evolutionary history. So. We seek the approval of each other, and uh, part of that, you know, enabled cooperation. If we all just went our own way, I mean, so there's a kind of other side to this, right? So I'm, I'm kind of um, a railing against conformity here, so the pressure to conform. But on the other hand, like if there was no tendency for humans to conform, I don't know if we could have kind of formed these tribes that had this kind of uh, glue. So conformity, the pre desire to conform maybe is maybe is a glue that helped us in our evolutionary past there are lots of things that helped us in our evolutionary past that kind of are unproductive now so so you know why do we, why do we like sweet stuff or why do we like you know saturated fats though so i guess these days saturated fats are supposed to be good but but let's say sugars right so why do we like uh, sugar it's because it has lots of calories and so that would have helped us big time in our evolutionary past but now it's like given this, uh, given this um, kind of atmosphere of plenty, eating sugar is basically bad, bad for you, right? Um, because because we have so much, we, we're not living under a calorie deficit as as our ancestors would have been. So I mean, this this idea, this pressure to conform, though it would have been very helpful in our evolutionary past, has certain uh, counterproductive uh, effects now, and so you know we should. Uh, so just like we shouldn't, you know, we should check ourselves and not eat like candy all the time, even though we, even though we want to. Uh, similarly, we, you know, we should. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping we, we can move towards norms that we feel less less pressure to conform. Uh, and in in some in some ways, I mean, the stakes are lower now, right? I mean, you can you know, you can you can get blowback from your peers. Uh, you can. I mean, in the worst case, you can get fired, uh, but but that's that still kind of pales in comparison to what people uh, experienced. You know, um, so I mean, Galileo, for example, was put under house arrest, or you know, people before him were uh, were basically um, executed for for heresy, right? So at least we don't have that, and in that way, again, we're we're privileged, right? So we're we're so afraid to speak our minds because we'll 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 think that you know, well, the colleague my colleagues won't think as well as it's me, it's me. Um, that that still pales in comparison to what, you know. Um, so I mean, one historical example is like Giordano Bruno, who was just before Galileo, who basically got um, uh, executed for committing heresy. Uh, I mean, yeah. So it, it might. So the cost might loom large when we look at, at the present moment, but when we look at history as a whole, it, it's not. You know, it's it's not that big a deal. And so. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, one of my hopes with the with the book is to hopefully encourage a norm of uh, of more uh, people willing to take these costs uh, to uh, improve uh, improve the commons, epistemic commons. Uh, we have a question from Julie Powers Killian. How has wokeness, cancel culture, tech suppression on hard sciences affected COVID-19 research? Uh, just for a bit of context, you know, as many of our viewers will know, uh, you had, you know, YouTube, for example, uh, limiting uh, and kind of removing videos that are offering dissenting perspectives on the issue, including from some, you know, fairly serious, credible academic researchers. So, so I kind of wonder, you know, COVID-19 is one recent instance uh, of a threat that has really mobilized many people where the stakes have been perceived to be very high. Uh, and I kind of wonder what you think about the kind of epistemic response. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's certainly a, a thing that is going to be um, big going forward, right? I mean, given our kind of informational landscape, um, if if Google, for example, puts something, you know, I mean, because Google Google's algorithm, if they kind of deprioritize something, it's it's really hard for people to to come to know about it. Um, and so that you know, going forward, that's going to be a very big. Um, and so I mean, yeah. So if within tech companies and so on, I think uh, um, there is much more. Uh, you know, they they have they have great power. So great, you know, as a great philosopher once said, great, great power comes great responsibility. Um, no, it was just uh, from Spider Man, but um, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so that's going to be something that's um, 
very very important going forward. Um, I haven't kept up that much with, with the research with COVID, but uh, but yeah, I mean it it affects really everything. Um, what the big platforms, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Google, choose to um, um, prioritize. Um, and so I, I think, again, I mean, you know, insofar as they deprioritize something, it lessens the confidence we ought to have in whatever we see, right? So uh, if, ever, you know, to the extent that they increase their kind of active control on information, rather than just being a kind of neutral algorithm, the more and more we're going to have the possibility of a blind spot that we, uh, you know, that, that could be counterproductive. Um, a question from Richard Scurry. Will free speech be a major issue in the 2022 midterms and 2024 presidential election? Uh, now, just before you answer, uh, just to give a bit of context here, uh, you were talking earlier on about how issues that become politically polarized become particularly difficult to talk about. And I think it's fair to say, when you look at the conversation around free speech and cancel culture, that this does seem to be an issue, a set of issues that has a kind of political valence. So I, I'm curious both to hear you answer the kind of initial question about the midterms, and the, the 2024 presidential election here in the US, but then also the kind of larger question about the political context around the importance of speaking your mind. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's a sad uh, kind of um, uh, development that, that free speech itself um, has, has become politicized. Um, it, it's weird because, you know, the, the kind of biggest, the kind of preeminent defense of free speech, um, and I encourage people to, to read it if they haven't, is just uh, John Stuart Mill Chapter 2 um, on Liberty. And there he really gives um, excellent arguments. And he, he really... Um, Kind of anticipates many of the objections or, or the concerns that people have today about uh, free speech. So, I mean, he talks all, you know, he he discusses uh, objections like, well, what about things that are noxious, or or what about uh, uh, opinions that are just uh, bad or or stupid or whatnot. Um, I mean, these are kind of objections people people raise now, and he really anticipated them. But the reason I bring up Mill is that um, you know Mill is is a kind of you know, he, he's part of the classical liberal tradition, and um, in many ways, he was he was progressive at, at his time. So he was a, a big um, a proponent of, of women's rights in many ways. So he he's a kind of progressive. So I mean, I don't think you know, I, it it's unfortunate that free speech has become politicized. But um, you know, if we look at the historical context, it really isn't like a you know, right wing issue or anything like that. Um, I mean, especially, I mean, if you look at the 1960s free speech movement really came from the left. So, um, so I mean, it need not be a, a politicized issue, but sadly it has become one. Um, and, you know, I, I think the more we can try to make make it less of a political issue, the, the more we can have clear thinking about it. Um, we have a, a, a few more questions. Um, one uh, is from Jerome Mueller. How will the fear of speaking up and having hard conversations inhibit the ability of organizational executives to avoid informational blind spots? Um, yeah, right. So if uh, it, so, informational executives like um, like it, like Google or uh... well, really just any leader of an organization. I, I think the idea is if there is this norm, you know, where we want to avoid you want to avoid speaking your mind, but then could it be that you're going to be surprised? You know, yeah, vibe. right, exactly. So if you're a leader of an organization, you want to know what's actually going on, right? So, so you know, this uh, comes back to, you know, ju just the kind of uh, case of Chernobyl or World War II. Um, if you're the leader of an organization, you want to know what's actually happening on the ground, right? So, so that you can craft the best response. Uh, but insofar as people kind of suppress information along the, along the line, um, you know, what gets up to you might not really be representative of, of what's happening. And so that can lead, uh, lead lead to bad decisions in really any context. It need not just be uh, politicized. If people are afraid to, um, uh, you know, reveal information or, or say what they think, um, that's that's certainly going to be a, a, a problem. So, yeah, I mean, so, so for, for a, an organization to work well in, in achieving its objectives, it seems like there should be an ethos of, uh, of speaking your mind, which, which I think is true for, 
for many organizations again that um, that aren't that don't touch on politi politicized issues, um, but you know, like a, a, a engineering firm or something, it seems uh, that people are much more you know. Is this turbine failing or not? Um, <laughs> we we again, don't want yeah. you to hide that information. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. If, if, if we don't know if the turbine has a problem, and then if you're the CEO, you say, okay, well, let's uh, mass manufacture this turbine, and then it doesn't work. Uh, that that's pretty bad. Um, but but thankfully, I mean, in those organizations, of, yeah. you've seen engineering organizations, you know, kind of where that has been a problem, where there's been a reluctance uh, to do something. Um, you know, just that might uh, cause problems for an individual, even if you see something that is concerning. So, so that kind of pathology can exist in a. In yeah, an it, it like certainly it certainly can exist, and um, you know, th th there are cases of, you know, bridges failing or or whatnot because people didn't um, didn't speak up. But, but uh, but thankfully, but thankfully, it's it's probably less uh, less big there than in in uh, you know journalistic institutions or or academic institutions. Rishi, um, one last question for you, and this is a follow-up question from Stevan. Um, are norms of argumentation changing because people feel something exhilarating about challenging longstanding norms around speech? So, so here, you know, it's almost that the kind of natural iconoclasm that you can kind of harness for the purpose of enriching the epistemic commons might actually now be turning against uh, cherish norms of free speech. I see, right, 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 right. So, so you know, we have had this broad norm of free speech uh, over over time, and um, and now the the kind of contrarian take or something is like, well, uh, maybe maybe that's not a good norm or something like that. Yeah, maybe that's you know that's part part of what's going on with the uh, with the iconoclasm. But um, yeah, I mean, but 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 just uh, you know, just to uh, just to say, I mean, some of these bad incentives have been there in the in the social sciences or certain politicized areas for a while. So it's not a new thing. Um, so if you, you know, uh, it, it, it's it's certainly it's certainly accelerating now. But if you look at, um, uh, you know, I mean, one one case that I think um, Alice Drager brings up is this case of Napoleon Chagnon, who was a I don't know if I pronounced his name right, but who was a kind of uh, anthropologist, and he, you know, suffered lots of blowback for, um, uh, for kind of doing work that that people didn't like. So, so yeah, it's it's it, it's it's certainly not a, a new phenomenon, but uh, but it's accelerating, and so so we need to be more uh, wary about it, in, in my opinion. Rishikesh, I'm afraid we're nearing the end of our time for today. Thank you very much. You've written an excellent, powerful book, and I think it will be a real resource for people trying to think clearly about how we improve our society and hopefully our politics. To everyone in the audience, I encourage you to go out and purchase Why It's Okay to Speak Your Mind. Thank you to everyone in the audience for your time and your many thoughtful questions. If you'd like to hear more conversations like today's or are interested in supporting our mission, I'd encourage you to subscribe to the Manhattan Institute's newsletters or consider making a donation. There are links for doing so in the comments window on your screen. Thank you again, Rishi. This was great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And thanks, thanks everybody for the questions. Uh, they were really thought provoking. So.